Welcome to Augmenting Native AWS Security Services to Achieve Enterprise Grade Security. Uh, my name is Christopher Hertz. I'm the VP of Cloud Security Sales at Rapid7, uh, and uh, I'm really pleased to be joined by John Meyer. John, do you want to do a quick introduction of yourself? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is John Meyer. I'm a partner solutions architect for AWS here underneath the cloud management tool space. Uh, just a little bit about me. I'm an evangelist of all things AWS. I'm really passionate about educating, teaching, and connecting with others about newer existing AWS services. So thanks, Chris, for the introduction. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just you know, quick background on me. I, I spent the last uh, 15 years in, in helping uh, mid-market and enterprise customers transform uh, you know, digital transformation in the cloud and uh, a lot around security of that. And I, I'm super excited to talk with John today. We're going to try and make this conversational. Uh, but I'm going to tee it off with just a little bit of, of, of um, setting the stage. We're going to talk a little bit about you know, why is cloud security a thing? You know, what, what is it? And then we'll roll into more about what, what are the cloud serv uh, security services people should be looking at and how to leverage them and how when and, and where to augment those as well. But the first thing I want to talk about, and, and I'll pass it to John shortly here to, to get his take on this, but one of the big things that we often see is that Technology innovation is rapidly accelerating. This is being driven by the adoption of Amazon Web Services um, uh, and all of those other products, but AWS obviously being a, an enormous leader there. The time in which people are adopting those uh, AWS is often shrinking, right? Being driven by the need to be competitive, uh, to drive agility, um, to innovate. Um, and then, uh, and then you know, in, also the thing that we should talk about now is that in, Increasingly, as we experience this pandemic, there's unplanned digital and workforce disruption. And all those things come together to create this three-dimensional risk um, that is often new risk that today is not managed by most companies, that it's a new form of risk. And this security achievement gap is what we're gonna be talking about closing today because it manifests um, as people adopt Amazon. Does that, does that sound accurate to you, John? Is that what you're seeing often in the marketplace? Yeah, Chris, uh, I, I really agree with your assessment there. Uh, in the beginning here, before this whole pandemic, uh, the the cloud adoption was at a kind of steady pace and ramping up and not as an exponential as it is now. Uh, due to the current situation that we're in, it has, the pace has just skyrocketed for cloud adoption. And really there's some gaps there within the security. So it's really accelerated during this time and has caused other, you know, kind of potential problems in the long run for security. So that's a real good assessment there. So, you know, this is where I, I will we'll talk about this. This is where we get into the fact that, as far as I know, and correct me if I'm wrong, John, there has never been a Amazon Web Services itself. That, you know, AWS has never been breached. That's correct, right? That it's it's 100% it's secure. Has been throughout its entire history. 100%. Yes. And so, you know, people go, well, wait. I read about breaches all the time. I read about S leaking S3 buckets. The answer is yes, but that isn't the service. That is the operation of that service. And so the thing that we want to talk about is the fact that cloud security is a thing because while Amazon is 100% secure, the way that you operate Amazon will leave you potentially open to insecure or non-compliant situations. Um, and in fact, you know, if you look at someone like Gardner, they're saying through 2025, 99% of cloud security failures writ large across all providers will be uh, the customer's fault. Um, and so what that manifests in the shared responsibility model. John, do you want to talk through about what the shared responsibility model is and why it's relevant to people who are thinking about cloud security eventually as we talk about, again, you know, leveraging cloud uh, security services from Amazon and where, where to, to, to also um, augment this. Yeah, thanks, Chris. So the AWS shared responsibility model is at the heart of it, is part of, and we're going to talk about that as really kind of part, talking about the well-architected framework, but the shared responsibility model is the customer is responsible for everything in the cloud, while AWS is responsible for the cloud. And really what that means is we're responsible for the data centers, uh, the compute, the storage databases, all the underlying hardware, while everything of the customers in the cloud, uh, your operating system, your application, identity and access management is really huge uh, in that one. So depending on what access permissions that you grant within your cloud area is really your responsibility. 
And something that, uh, Chris, something that we're going to talk about is shifting left. And uh, I don't want to jump to it now. So whenever is a good time, we can jump right in there because that's something that's uh, a new term, but more or less leveraging AWS as the responsibility and focusing more on your application. Well, so I love where you're going. We're going to be with the shifting left, I think, in two slides. But but let's set the table for that because I, I think it's yeah. important to, to set the table. So when you think about, so someone might be looking be like, well, this doesn't seem like a big deal, right? I'm responsible for my security today. I've got my two people who are responsible for data center security. The challenge often arises in the, in the shared responsibility model that one of the amazing things that Amazon does is it allows you to democratize access to infrastructure, right? You're able to, to really shift and say, um, you know, how do you gain access to velocity and agility that drives uh, experimentation, that leads to innovation, that leads to uh, competitiveness, that drives ultimately profitability for companies, right? That's, the, that's why people are adopting Amazon, that story. Well, it, it starts with providing self-service access to, the, to Amazon to as many people as possible who, who need that, right? So they can do all those things. They have that agility. What that means is that you've gone from maybe a small people who are in command and control of all of your IT systems, which finally makes it slow, um, to a place where you've democratized access, right? Where you now maybe have dozens, if not hundreds, if not thousands of analysts and engineers and developers who now can provision and configure their, their own cloud services. And that results in amazing outcomes, right? That we just described. But it also creates a lot of risk because now you have, you've democratized it and you have to also democratize security alongside of that, right? Um, and I think that's where we'll, we'll get to shifting left. Uh, anything you want to add on there about sort of that, that, that shift, um, John, before we move on? No, not at all. That's actually a good point. I can't wait to talk about that. I know we have another upcoming slide here, the well-architected, but... Uh, and we're going to be jumping and talking about it a little bit. But, you know, Chris, real quick, I actually have a question for you that when we, yeah. when we started this conversation here, you know, we talked about uh, the ever changing landscape during this current pandemic. Uh, and you and I had a couple conversations over the last months. How has the security landscape changed from now to then and moving forward? What are your thoughts as we get into this? Yeah, well, I think the big one is that it has put increased pressure on. Um, IT professionals and IT security professionals who are already overtaxed, right? And, and, in, and it's also disrupted how we operate, right? And so if you think about, if we go back to a moment and say in the shared responsibility model, a lot of this is about how we operate the cloud. When you disrupt how you operate, you disrupt the sort of regular pace of things. It might be process, it might be people, it might be technology. You're adopting new technology, you're, adopt, you're having to modify processes on the fly, your people are, are now disrupted because they're distracted. All those things result in more opportunities for error, right? And you're trying to move more quickly because you're trying to respond to real-time events that are just absolutely changing the way you, your, your business has to operate. That stuff manifests in just unbelievable pressure on cloud security or, or security professionals or cloud operations folks um, who are already under stress. Um, and I think, you know, if we just think about how that results in sort of like, is that, what is the outcome of that? Well, let's just talk about before the pandemic, before all this initial pressure, it was a huge issue. We, we published the 2020 cloud misconfigurations report earlier this year. We looked back at 2018 and 2019 and found that there were 81 major breaches in 2018, as we defined them, from misconfigurations. And in 2019, those that rose close to 50%, a 42% increase to 115, which these breaches, uh, estimated five trillion dollars in economic damages, you know, and that's just by the way the ones we classify as major. This is the impact of why this is so important to understand both the shared responsibility model and, as we'll talk about, be able to start to to use the tools available to you within Amazon, and then certainly also third-party tools like Divi Cloud to really ensure that you have good security um, because it's it's an enormous challenge and. And then, you know, I think, and I'll, I'll, I'll re hand this over to you in a, in a second, John, but the other part of it is, and we, we also published a 2020 state of enterprise cloud and container adoption security report. This actually was based on a survey of uh, close to 2,000 IT professionals in 2020 across all industries across the world. Um, and if you think about one of the things, you, we, we go back to the, response, the shared responsibility model, and you might say, well, how do I know what good looks like? Right, you've democratized this. How do I know what good looks like to operate the cloud? Um, 
And, and how do I tell my people what good looks like? Well, that's where frameworks come into play. Um, and what we found was that 42% of the IT professionals we surveyed, these are smart people, did not know which frameworks they're coming to use to maintain compliance with standards and regulations. And that's really tough because if you don't know what good looks like, you're not setting, you're being set up for, for success. I don't know, when you think about frameworks, this is something that comes up at Amazon, I'm sure, with AWS, John, what, what are, you know, to be, I assume you, you know, Amazon has some frameworks that they tend to think about or, or, or recommend as people think about what good looks like. Yeah, Chris, before I jump into the well-architected framework, I actually do have a comment on the cyber attack slide, right? Uh, yeah. The one previous yeah. to this yeah, one. Please. Uh, so you you mentioned it, and you and I are kind of were talking about it, and it really brings up a point that the need for security is up front and not an afterthought mm -hmm. during implementation. Agreed. And, you know, we're all we're talking about this current pandemic that we're in, and you know during the times of the crisis, you know experimentation is really high, trying new things. Uh, you know, you, your team to have complete visibility into governance and compliance across your cloud. And that's where Divi Cloud comes in there and giving you that visibility. So this is really important to kind of take note that, you know, we 81 major breaches in 2018 and 115 in 2019. Now think about what the numbers might be here in 2020 with yeah. how fast everybody's moving to the cloud. Well, and the shocking thing about breaches, and then we'll get back to the architecture, is that you often don't know about it. It's trailing, right? You'll find out 12 months after the fact. And yep. the damage is already done. And you know, it just it just it's a terrible position to be in. Um, and so I agree that like, you know, you want to, you know, day zero is when you want to put that that landing zone down. That, that gives you um, assurance that you'll have continuous security and compliance and that you're, you're architected in a way that positions you for that. Um, but I guess let, let's start with how do you, how do you know, go back to the well-architected uh, concept. You know, how, how does Amazon recommend folks adopt cloud and, and adopt it with frameworks for success? Yeah, so Chris, uh, this is a big one here, is a well-architected framework. If you haven't heard of it, if you can just search it and bring it up, AWS provides basically, describes like key concepts or design principles and architectural best practices for actually designing and running your workloads in the cloud. So really by sitting down and answering a set of foundational questions, you learn how well your system architects and aligns with cloud best practices. And then you're also provided like guidance on how to make improvements. You know, the, the AWS Well Architected Framework uh, is really about improving your application, whether it's already in the cloud or moving to the cloud to make sure that it's ready to run in there. And you're just sitting down, typically challenging yourself on how well you're designed and handling certain things from security to performance to operational excellence. And then the you know, the big one there is the security aspect that uh, you should spend a lot of time on on how you handle certain issues. So uh, yeah. I always recommend and work closely with the well-architected team at, on a number of these. And I really like how it challenges how you're currently set up or you wanna implement moving towards the cloud. And the well-architect does work on-premise or in a cloud environment. Yeah and tailored to that one. What are your thoughts on this, Chris? I know you've dealt with the well-architected. You've yeah. probably reviewed a bunch of the questions. Well, we, we, we always recommend folks leverage well-architected as a starting point. And then we also, folks will come to us and say, well, what, what about what does good look like from an operational standpoint so we want to go forward? And we often say, look, you, know, you may have standards you already comply with, right? You may have SOC 2, you might have HIPAA, you might have GDPR, you might have ISO 27001. But you know, if you were saying, I don't have any of those, we often think things like the NIST cybersecurity framework, NIST CSF, there's also the CIS benchmarks that are published by Amazon. These are frameworks that we commonly see folks use, but NIST CSF has been one that we really are a, bit, are a big fan of from an operational security framework. Um, so it's, it's sort of this two, you know, two punch, it's like, yeah, you wanna make sure you're well architected from day one, but then make sure that operationally, um, you, you are always aligning with a standard that you can be clearly defined and articulated, not just to your internal audience, um, but to external audiences, whether that's customers or, or assessors or auditors um, or, or even your peers or, or the board. Um, and those, that, that framework is important because it sets up, in my opinion, shifting left. Because if, if you start at a point which you're well, where you have something like well-architected and you have frameworks that you can leverage, you now have a starting point which you can communicate security back 
to the people who are now participating in it you know, in a more meaningful way. And that's where I think it is goes back to the fact that <clears throat> when we talk about cloud, it is about democratization. It's about self-service access. And that means democratizing not just access to the cloud, but democratizing the way in which we secure the cloud. And, and it's about finding ways to make developers and engineers more participant. And that often means bringing things to them at the right time and the right place. And that's what shifting left is about. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go there in a second, John, to ask you to sort of talk about what you think, to, you know, your view of shift left. But the, the reason I bring this up is that today, the way that, that we approach security in the cloud is often wrong. It still sort of hones to like this idea of like command and control. And what that means is that, and we found this in our, our cloud adoption security report, almost half of the respondents we talked to, uh, th whose organizations use public cloud, said their developers or engineers ignore or circumvent cloud security compliance policies. Half. Um, and, and the reason often is because the way we're trying to present those policies is often at the wrong place at the wrong time. And so I think that, that you know, I, and this creates this misalignment between developers and securities. Uh, so talk to me a little bit, John, how you think about shift left and why that's so important in this world of, of cloud and trying to align these things. I think we're going to spend a little bit of time on this slide because I got two yeah. topics with regards to it, developers and security still misaligned uh, because there's an importance here. But shifting left is a big topic right now. And if you think about it, uh, AWS is responsible for security of the cloud. So why not leverage everything that AWS is doing for you? So managing the underlying infrastructure, uh, the, the instances, the hardware, all that portions, what you want to do uh, is really transition that responsibility to AWS and let us manage all the patching of like OS is that you don't need to control. So like a serverless environment or the underlying container services, you know, those those things you want to let AWS manage or manage services if you're going like SQS, uh, that that is really crucial. Why build your own when it's already readily available to you? And you transfer that and you focus more on your application and building and yeah. honing all that. That's yeah. really where I feel the importance of. And I think that's really, it resonates true. Why not make that shared responsibility model more AWS and less on you and you focus? Yes. Well, I, I think it's important to think about, it, you know, often where we present security issues, we present them to developers at runtime, and often it's about how do we we shift those that cloud security conversation into DevOps, right? So, uh, and you know, that may be through the you know, if you're using pipelines, you can automate this. It may be that you're using things like infrastructure as code, so cloud formation templates from Amazon. Um, maybe Terraform if you're, if you're doing, you know, if that's the product you use. But, um, but if you're able to shift where you talk about security um, and the way you talk about security, so if you're able to educate people during the DevOps lifecycle, if you're able to automate that through the use of pipelines, it really reduces friction. It creates a more productive developer um, and it delivers the, a better experience, which means they're more participant in the security process. And so I really think it's like, a lot of how you, we should be thinking about cloud security today is how do we shift cloud security into the natural processes um, that developers are already engaged in? Because whenever we ask them to engage in a security activity that's outside of their natural processes, that's a friction. And they're less likely to participate and they're more likely to call us a four letter word. And our goal should be to get the highest rate of participation with the greatest degree of efficiency so that as security professionals, what we're doing is enabling and amplifying the efforts of our digitally savvy business units, that we're really accelerating them. And that we're putting guardrails in place to, uh, and providing good communication and education around the frameworks, around the policies, um, and around how to, how to drive that. Um, so that's, that's certainly how we've always used it, John. I, I don't know if that, if that resonates with you. Uh, you know, Chris, I swear you're in my mind here right now because you used a couple of the things I wanted to talk about. One, you just said you just mentioned that um, when you're asking developers to implement security outside of their normal one, if you go back and read this statement, almost 49 percent say that they're going to bypass it uh, yeah. or ignore and circumvent it. And uh, I, I think you're going to the term DevSecOps. And I had to throw that in there because you and I were talking about that originally. So. I'm going to let you comment on that, but I got a couple of things for that one. But the biggest thing that I want to talk about is you mentioned guardrails. And 
when I talk, when what I think what's missing in some of the organizations are two things: giving developers and engineers the ability to run fast, allowing them to experiment without blockers, but putting guard rails in place. And then the second thing is working together with security to make sure it's part of their daily routine and already implemented. Yep. Yes. Uh, I'm going to let you comment on DevSecOps, and then I'm going to. I'd like to jump in there, and we can continue to move on. Yeah, yeah. So look, I'll, I'll let you. I'll, you know, DevSecOps for us is it's it's how do you embed again security into the development process. By the way, that that's code security, that's, but it's yep. also cloud security, right? And so certainly it's and that's often the piece where people miss is that a lot of focus on on code security, but we really think cloud security should be part of that DevSecOps conversation as well. And it is shifting your cloud security policies into things like evaluation of, of templates, right? So with Divi Cloud. For example, we, we allow the policies that we enforce at runtime also to, to, to be evaluated during uh, the CI CD process, you know, looking at, terror, uh, like example, Terraform plans um, and ensuring that those plans before they're even built um, would be secure and compliant. And therefore, uh, you know, delivering that feedback during the DevOps process, embedding security. But it's also culturally, as you point, organizationally, it's it's shifting from command and control to trust but verify, right? It's it's enabling business units to operate that way, um, and it's also uh, you know doing things like embedding security professionals into these DevOps teams, right? So that they're not some sort of foreign uh, you know person or object that, that in fact they're sort of an embedded partner that's actually there as an ally and as an asset, not as as a four letter word. Yeah, uh, my last thing that I got on this one, really, uh, you know, as we mentioned, it's more than just inserting security into a DevOps model and coming up with a new term, DevSecOps. Yeah. But basically, you're like building security in your everyday processes or development teams, and that yeah. security yeah. is a shared responsibility yeah. and should be integrated from end to end. So whether we call it DevOps, DevSecOps, it's always been actually ideal to include security as an integral part of an entire app lifecycle. And, you know, DevSecOps is about building that security and not securing that functions as a perimeter around apps and data. Uh, so really, that's where it comes from uh, for that one. So, Chris, that was a really good topic. Sorry we took a little bit extra on that slide, but it was really important. Well, let's, let's dive into the meat of what I'm sure people are excited to hear about, yep. John, which is how to, and when to use native controls in AWS. Um, and I'll set you up and say, as you know, AWS has a bunch of really great security tools, right? And, and by the way, the whole goal is to make it easier for everyone on this call to, to actually secure their workloads in AWS. Um, and we've already talked about how AWS is, is the world's most secure cloud platform, right? So there's no breaches there. But again, this is about how AWS helps you do that. And maybe just, you know, and there's a deep set of cloud security tools, things like networking, encryption, identity, compliance. Um, do you want to sort of set the table and then we can dive into some more depth on that? Yeah, so this slide is just a quick high level. We're going to actually jump into a lot of these, like the identify, yeah. um, protect, detect, and everything. But really, the native controls around networking, security, and identity. So even before you create and utilize a single resource within AWS, you need to have a plan and actions on how your organization might control access or utilize those resources within AWS. That's where yeah. identity and access management come into focus. Yeah. And then next, you're gonna you know, you want to stay compliant when changes occur. What type of encrypt, encryptions are available, and then how you're going to use them. And then you're going to protect your resources or application when it comes around uh, your networking. So in the next few slides, we are going to talk about some of the AWS native controls and when to use them. Yeah. So Chris, this is for you, and then I'm going to jump right into it. Yeah. So I, I, the first is that we, you've heard us talk about the NIST cybersecurity framework before. Um, and Amazon has been phenomenal in, in helping to really support and align with the NIST cybersecurity framework. So there's a lot out there. If you haven't explored this before, you're saying, gosh, I don't, I don't know where to start. And if you think about NIST CSF, really there are some core aspects. Um, there's identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Um, and that really, if you look below, you know, Amazon has really done a great job of, of um, aligning and saying, hey, what does that mean in the world of, of AWS, right? So for identify, it's asset management and governance and risk assessment, right? For protect, it's access control, data security, um, uh, information protection processes. For detect, it's anomalies and events. Um, it's uh, for respond, it's, it's analysis, mitigation. And then with recover, it's things like recovery planning, 
uh, improvements communication, right? And what's beautiful about this is that uh, for many folks, you know, they do really struggle and say, I just don't know what good looks like, or I want to improve the maturity of my security. I was on a phone with an Amazon customer a couple of days ago, and they said, you know, we are, I said, where are you on your cloud maturity, uh, sort of your cloud adoption process? And they said, well, we are both mature and immature. We are mature in our use of cloud and that our developers are all using it and we have enormous use of cloud. We are immature in the fact that our governance is not kept up. And that's where, and they're saying, and, and they said, you know, we're, you know, we're looking to mature our governance. And this something like the cybersecurity framework, the CSF is a great place to start in part because it really, you know, Amazon has invested so much in helping to align that so you can really understand it. Um, I'll pause there, John, see if there's anything you want to add to this slide and then, and then you know, happy to advance the next one. Yeah, so uh, just off of this slide, we can talk about a ton of securities, but uh, just AWS services alone, identify, protect, detect. Uh, you're just talking about like really at a high level, you know, just some quick that I'm going to name. Oh, you're going to jump right into the slide. All right, I'll, I'll get yeah. going right into it. If, 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 I think I got quite some point here. Let's, let's dive it all in, man. Let's talk. Yeah, about yeah, it. yeah. I actually, I was ready to go for it because, all right, let, let's talk about this slide a little bit here, The really the meat of it, and when to implement some of these native controls that are already in place. Let's start on the left here. You have Identify. Uh, some of them that are near and dear to my heart, AWS Control Tower, which is the actual UI for AWS Landing Zone, uh, something near and dear that I have played around, implemented, and completely love the governance and controls that really reside around organizations. So let's talk about organizations and Control Tower. They really provide like the overall governance of an organization, allowing for what we talk about with regards to guardrails and not blockers. So allow your developers to run fast and then if, when they hit a guardrail, okay, they can't do that one. You know, I, I know when you heard identify most are thinking that why isn't AW, uh, AWS CloudTrail in there? And I'll get to that in a minute as we get down to it. Uh, next one. Right here, AWS Trusted Advisor. This should always be looked at, viewed. You should be always doing something with this, whether you're ingesting it from like uh, Divi Cloud, you're, you're handling some of those controls and looking at some of those things, but it provides real-time guidance to follow best practices. You know, from the basic, obviously, optimization, your AWS infrastructure performance, but one of the really important topics is security. If it isn't, and it isn't a one-time evaluation, but real-time visibility. And then the last one I'm going to really mention, now I'm not going to touch on each one of these, but some of the best ones that, you know, we already talked about well-architected. Uh, and the last one before I give Chris anything on the identity and we'll move on to protect is AWS Config, which is a service that actually enables you to assess, audit, and evaluate the configuration of your AWS resources. So it continuously monitors and records your AWS resource configuration and allows you to automate the evaluation of recorded configurations against desired configurations. And I'm gonna pause right there. Chris, you got anything you'd like to add for Identify? No, let's let's move on to Protect. Let's talk about, you know, what are, what are the highlights of the Protect side? And again, I think the important thing here, folks, is these, you know, as you think about how do I frame when and where I use Amazon Web Services native security tools, this is one of the mechanisms to really do that, which is that if you've gone through and said, all right, I wanna line up against this CSF framework, um, then this cybersecurity framework, um, if I want to do that, here's a, a roadmap to how I can start working through that. Here's what I use, when I use it, and how it applies against that 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 really important mechanism. But yeah, please, John, continue on. Yeah, Chris, that's actually a really good point here. All of these are important, but knowing when to implement them or utilize them is really what we're trying to talk about here and highlight some of the ones that you want to implement uh, up front and some that you want to evaluate. Uh, protection. Now, I'm only going to talk on two of all of this because if you think about it, we've already talked about identity and access management. Uh, everybody knows about it. Uh, everybody feels that they ha have kind of grasped that, even though that has a lot of control and power on that one. But I'm actually going to talk about your application type protection here. Uh, and the two that I want to talk about are right there on the left side of AWS Shield and AWS WAF. So AWS Shield is a managed distribution denial of service. So a DDoS protection uh, really safeguards those applications running in AWS, provides always on detection, automatically inline mitigations that minimize your application's downtime and latency. So think about that one a little bit. 
But uh, the other one is AWS WAF. And I actually just popped in my head. I do want to mention one more. So the WAF is your web application firewall. That's actually going to protect your application uh, or APIs against common web exploits that may affect availability, compromise your security, which is really big, and consume excess resources. So if you always want to take uh, that security and application uptime into consideration, these are two of the main ones that you want to look for your application. The last one I want to take a look at is your AWS Transit Gateway, which is on your network side, which is isolated in your network traffic, uh, you know, just between you and your on-premise. Uh, you can tie in multiple ones on there using AWS Direct Connect and keeping all your data uh, privately, um, you know, house. So that's all I'm going to add on the protect. I, Chris, uh, anything you want to yeah. add there? One thing, you know, I will I will touch base on identity access management. I do think it's an area where people really should spend some time. Um, you know, if you, just within a single account with AWS, there the poli the policy prioritization with boundaries. There are five layers of of sort of methods you can drive access. There's service control policies. I was going to say, can you policy. name all those, Chris? Yeah, I can. Uh, SCPs, resource based policy, uh, permission uh, permissions boundary, session policy. Identity, identity based policy, right? Ah, um, oh, there you go, there you go. I was counting them. So, uh, and then you got all your wild cards and conditionals and all that. But it's it is a complex world where if you you really should focus in on governance around IAM because it is the perimeter, right? And so when you want if you want to think about identity access management, if you have uh, overly permissive combinations of identity access management policies. Um, that really can increase your attack surface in a way that is not healthy, um, and ultimately also at least you have a larger blast radius should a security incident occur. So spending some time around understanding effective access relative to your cloud services and, and resources, um, either through a um, principal view or a resource view or an application view, super, super important. So I, that, that's something I'll throw out there from an IAM standpoint. Actually, uh, Chris. So, what do you what are your thoughts on the IAM analyzer there? Yeah, the IAM analyzer is is really awesome. We certainly recommend recommend it heavily. Um, we're actually also, you know, as I think we talked about John. We're, we're going to be launching in just a uh, about a month a IAM governance module for Divi Cloud that we think is going to really revolutionize uh, the ability for folks to quickly understand their effective access. And, you know, the overlap of both those policies and what effectively is available, marry that with a lot of information, you know, traditional business information, provide context, and then really be able to make good decisions about how to drive towards least privilege. So we're, we're pretty excited and bullish on, on, on that. Um, and that will be coming out in, in uh, late September. Uh, I, I'm hearing, Chris, that you and I are going to do something live with that. Is that... <laughs> That, 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 that maybe yeah that's uh that we're we're excited it's 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 an amazon only focus to begin with um uh but we, we've got a number of folks using it in early adoption and it's just been phenomenal helping them drive towards uh governing identity access management more robustly but let's let's not let's not pause yep. there i know we've got limited time today with everybody on the phone i want to make sure we have time for questions let's talk about the tech because i think that was where you're going next yeah it was so Chris, let's talk about detection here. Uh, the top two that I want to talk about is Amazon Inspector, you know, mm -hmm. an automated security assessment service that helps improve your security and your compliance of the applications deployed on AWS. Yeah. And then the last one, which is really big and we're always constantly releasing something uh, out about it, is Amazon Guard Duty, which is yeah. your threat detection service that continuously monitors for malicious activity and unauthorized behavior to protect your AWS account workloads including your data that's stored in S3. Uh, when I started first playing with this one, uh, it was really cool because uh, I had a, you know, an EC2 instance out there and I was just playing around with this before I joined AWS and I noticed that it actually had like Bitcoin mining, mining coming on it. So yeah, I completely shut that down. I really liked uh, the quick detection of that one. Uh, yeah, Chris, anything to add before I jump? We're a big fan of Guard Duty and Inspector. In fact, actually, we ingest those signals into Divi Cloud to take action. You know, I think cool things about Guard Duty. I mean, one of the things I always like to tout about Amazon's state of services is that they often have a richer access to data than any third party can provide. So when you're thinking about something like threat uh, detection, well, I, I believe Guard Duty is the only product that actually is in the market that accesses things like the DNS logs, which are just simply unavailable to other third parties. And so there's this richer plus 
you know, if you think about the machine learning AI that's behind things like guard duty, you know, it, 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 you know, Amazon has access to literally the entire you know, set of data, like you know, everything that's happening within the Amazon data center. And so they can train these models and this AI on just like absolutely enormous quantities of data. And that's just, to me, these products, these native products are just so effective. They have such high efficacy. So it's really how do you, how do you effectively use these at scale and how do you consume the findings and act on them is really what comes down. And that's where we'll talk about a little bit later with things like Divi Cloud where we augment. You know, one of the things we do is we actually help customers consume guard duty and make sense of it and make it act, you know, and act on it. So we're we're huge fans of those. Um, but yeah, let's let's keep going to respond and, and recover. And I, I think you're gonna talk about Macy later as well. Yeah, all... actually I was just gonna mention that. Don't worry, I'm not I, skipping I, Macy. I got a Macy, slide just for Macy. <laughs> Macy is my like, I love Macy, man. It is a, you know, it is a especially when it comes to data exfiltration. Like, so let's let's go on to respond. Um, yeah. yeah. So let's talk about respond. Now I said in the beginning, don't you know everybody wonders why AWS CloudTrail is not there. So CloudTrail in the automate investigation portion of it is providing you that visibility based off specific events that actually occur. So, you know, what is happening in your AWS environment, whether it's uh, API calls, console events that are happening and being triggered, it's already happened, but your cloud trail is monitoring that and that's where you can perform actions and that's where the response comes in there. Uh, always, I recommend, first of all, CloudTrail should be turned on not only for your accounts, but for all regions, whether you're using them or not. Because if you don't have it turned on for regions you're not using, you can't monitor if a resource actually gets spun up in that region unless you have other guardrails in place for that one. Uh, and you can continuously monitor, retain account activity related to it across your entire infrastructure. The last one that I'm gonna mention here on, on the response is Amazon Detective, which makes it easy to analyze, investigate, and quickly identify the root cause of a potential security issue or suspicious activities. So it's collecting logs from all your AWS resources, and then it's using machine learning, statistical analysis uh, behind it to build a linked set of data that enables you to easily conduct faster and more efficient security investigations on why something happened and how you can resolve these in the future or remediate which would be your response. Um, before I jump into recover and get to Macy, because I knew we're running short on time here, I just want to make sure we get the point across. Yeah, no, I, I think that's great. Let's 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 keep moving. All right. So the last part of recover, cloud formation. Uh, if you need to be able to spin up resources, immutable, spin up in a new environment, new region, or whatever, you should utilize the type of automation. Cloud formation allows you to do that. And then talking about S3. S3 is by far the biggest thing. I love the sector. I love the uh, S3 and how it's being utilized. And I'm really deep diving into that one, but your snapshots, your archives, your deep glacier, your what you're doing here is you're having backups if you need them in the environment. So everything pretty much runs or is being stored in S3. So it's a real crucial uh, AWS service. Yeah. So let's so, talk. You want to talk Macy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's talk Macy here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one, but when it first came out, there was a lot of confusion on how you're going to use it, uh, how much data it's processing. Oops, I turned it on and I didn't realize that one. What is Macy? Well, Macy actually discovers and protects your sensitive data in AWS. Uh, as organizations manage growing volumes of data, identify and protecting their sensitive data at a scale, it actually can become increasingly complex very expensive and time consuming. So Macy automates the discovery of this sensitive data at your scale and lowers the cost of protecting your data. Really what it's doing, it's automa automatically provides an inventory of all your S3 buckets, including unencrypted buckets, publicly accessed bu buckets, buckets shared across AWS accounts, which is actually a really huge one, and outside of those that you define within your AWS organization. And then what, what, what is really the cool part and that Detective does, but Macy also utilizes and that we leverage is it applies machine learning and patterns that are matching those techniques to the buckets that you identify and alert you on sensitive data, such yeah. as PII data. And Chris, that's a huge one here on this topic with security and uh, buckets that are public or unsecure. So yeah. that just well, goes right in there. And let me, let me give you an example where I think this is really important to talk about because it, 
customers come to us and say, hey, you know, look, we, buckets can be open. Like there's a reason that buckets are open. So we were just, I was just talking to a company where they have a lot of websites. Um, they use buckets to provide files um, and host files for you know, all sorts of people and it's publicly accessible. The challenge becomes, um, you know, because you have that, if you just say, oh, well, I want to know, I want to report when there's an open bucket. Well, that's kind of hard because you have thousands of open buckets, right, in this case. And so it's, you know, looking for like, oh, is there a bucket that's open? That doesn't tell me a lot, right? Like that's, and so Amazon and, and even Divi Cloud, you know, can provide uh, mechanisms to be able to say, oh, well, I, I get alerted if there's a bucket that's open and, and I can go try and solve for that. But how do I know whether that bucket being open is right or wrong? Applying Macy as part of that process really says, okay, but if a bucket is open, at least I will also then be able to marry up the context of whether or not that bucket actually contains data that is, is sensitive. And I, that's the big piece, which is that, you know, you, it is, it, this solving for data issues, data breach issues, data exfiltration, data loss, leakage issues with something like an S3 bucket is really complex. And the best way to do that is to marry things up like with policies that look at detecting if a, a bucket is open and if it is open, then applying something like Amazon Macy to it. So you have this double ability to say, all right, yes, I'm aware it's open, but I also have this monitoring now on that. And that's the sort of better together story that frankly, when you think about something like Divi Cloud is really powerful. It's like, we can take all these things and bundle them together and automate them so that every time that you have a bucket that is open and public and routable and all those things that, that, if, that you are also applying something like Macy to ensure that, that you have another layer of um, telemetry into whether or not there's risk there. Um, so I, I, and I'm a big fan of that because otherwise, you know, it's, it's just so hard to manage this at scale. So let's let's talk about exactly that. I just let us into augmentation and automation, and, and we'll, we're going to we're going to run through this fairly quickly because we don't. I want to get to the point where we can have some some questions uh, as well. But um, you know, look, I'll just give a quick opinion, which is that um, everything we just talked about is essential. It is absolutely essential that you're leveraging native tools. Um, and it is absolutely sufficient to a point. Um, but that what we have found is there's an inverse relationship between sort of risk um, and, and adoption. And we'll talk about that shortly. Often the way that, that people approach cloud security, especially with native tooling, is that they start to build scripts. And the problem with that is, again, that's great, but it's, again, only good as, as maybe a starting point. And what we often find is it's an unsustainable strategy. I often call it Janeware. You know, it's 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 written by Jane, and if Jane leaves, then everything falls apart. Or if Jane gets busy, she can't extend it. Or if Jane um, uh, doesn't have the right expertise, uh, maybe he misses something. And so it's brittle, um, and it's not an enterprise-grade, sustainable, scalable strategy that really amplifies and enables again all this innovation. The speed it starts to slow things down. Um, I don't know, John, if you've seen that as well, but that's that's our take on sort of how people approach it. Often is they start with a with with the native tools, they start with a little scripting uh, to try and automate and, and scale that. I don't know if that's, that resonates with you. Uh, yeah, Chris. So that just brings me back to my old days of traditional data center management uh, where somebody, somebody built the script, somebody built the environment to manage and monitor it, and that person grows with it, now owns it, and can't scale. And now all the updates, uh, new stuff that comes out, uh, they're not implemented in a quick, timely fashion. So what happens is they're only as good as the person writing it at the time, and then yeah. it doesn't grow and expand. So uh, you brought back some memories there, Chris, on that <laughs> one. And that's why uh, this is really, it, it's very complex and hard to manage. Well, so what, we've, what we often talk about, is, and this is where it gets, is that, look, everyone should be using cloud security native tools immediately, right? And we talked about this before from day one, and you should be layering those on. And what we often find is that for folks that, you know, they start at point A, um, they have a risk appetite that's different for every organization, um, and, and they need to define that, and they need to get their risk below that in terms of how they operate cloud. And they can often do that, uh, especially in the early days, with limited com cloud complexity by deploying, um, you know, cloud security tools and maybe some scripting. But then what we find is that as complexity increases, and by the way, that's just complexity of scale of AWS, it's complexity of the number of accounts maybe that you have in AWS, um, the number of organizations, et cetera. As you get more complex, it becomes harder and harder. By the way, if you layer on multi-cloud on that, it becomes darn near impossible 
because you have differences between the different native tooling, uh, security tooling between the multi-cloud. And that's where we often talk about bringing in a product like Divi Cloud to really augment um, the native cloud security tooling and that together, the CSP Security plus Divi Cloud will keep our customers under that risk appetite they've defined, whereas just the security alone may start to outstrip that risk appetite just because it becomes unmanageable. I don't know if, if John, if, if you've seen that, but you know, just talking about things like Macy, as we talked about before, it's that ability to automate the use of Macy at scale, for example, that Divi Cloud really signs, it's not stopping using Macy, it's not stopping using all the great things, it's how do we use them more effectively, how do we target their use efficiently do so at scale automatically so there's a consistent practice um that's that's where we really see this coming in and helping out yes yeah, so i got one quick point on that one when you're leveraging divi cloud and aws native tools you're staying on that green line and you can continue to uh implement and experiment without having all that uh, you know, really kind of stretching past that risk appetite and being scarce where you're you're just continuously on and you know that you're being protected and managed. So that's a good point. There. I actually like that slide. And I'm going to spend one minute here on automation, which is that, you know, we're just, you know, Divi Cloud is big fans of automation. That's, you know, we have a native automation engine built into our product. Uh, it allows us to really drive um, multiple layers of automation. And, and often people think, oh, automation, that's a bit scary. I'm not ready to go there yet. But that's where we have really good guidance on saying, hey, look, start with automation that again goes back to things like visibility and accountability through logging. So for example, we can automate the enablement of CloudTrail. Someone turns CloudTrail off, we can turn it back on, right? We can enable that at scale in ways that are very helpful. Two, make sure that you are automating you know, the impact, the, those sort of impactful best practices. That goes back to things like Macy. If your best practice is to turn on Macy for any bucket that's publicly accessible, we'll automate that process. Uh, governance and account hygiene. Here it's around things like, again, let's make sure you're taking those standards like NIST CSF, uh, Divi Cloud ships with hundreds of policies out of the box that map back to things like NIST CSF or inter 53 or HIPAA or GDPR, SOC 2, ISO 27001, et cetera, et cetera. Take those and apply them continuously. Ensure that you have that governance that is always there. Um, in, you know, identifying risk and allowing you to, to, to drive remediation, which by the way, May simply be messaging or ticketing or notification um, or uh, or things along those lines, but can also advance to level four, which is sort of classic concept of automated remediation, where you can actually reconfigure cloud services on the fly, and Divi Cloud can do that for you, so that you can take that bucket that has been detected with you know sensitive data in it through Macy and actually automate that bucket to be to be shut down, so it's or closed off, so it's no longer publicly accessible, all in real time. Um, because we use things like CloudWatch and CloudTrail to do 60 second detection of change within Amazon and therefore can automate in real time to address security risk before it becomes um, something that's exploited. Um, and with that, just a quick recap, Divi Cloud does protect cloud and container environments from misconfigurations, policy violations, threats, and identity access management challenges across Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud Platform, Alibaba Cloud, and Kubernetes. Sorry, John, I know you're on the call, but those other clouds do exist. <laughs> and, no offense uh, to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on that one, I was actually gonna, I was actually gonna comment on your slide before then, but you, I see it on this one uh, about yeah. the um, blog article yeah. that was written, which I thought was very valuable. So I won't steal your thunder. We can continue on and pretend like they don't exist. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And so for folks, just before we wrap up, we're about to go to Q and A with you all. Uh, thank you for attending. There are some helpful resources, some of which I've mentioned here. Available at our website, you can uh, feel free to, to follow that link and, and uh, go there. Uh, you can also gain full lifecycle cloud security today with a free 30-day trial of Divi Cloud by Rapid7. You can go and request that at divicloud.com/free-trial. Uh, again, that's a 30-day trial. So we're looking forward to hearing some uh, some questions from you all. And John, thank you so much for just such a, a wonderful, uh, you know, I, I feel like really educational. Uh, you know, rundown of, of all the cool native cloud security tools um, uh, available to the folks on the call and, and to everybody who, who watches later. Yeah, uh, so Chris, thanks. I really appreciate it. I can't wait to get to some of those questions and answer some of those. Uh, I really enjoy being here with you and having this conversation about some things and I can't wait to some future ones.